It is no secret that Airbnb is one of the hottest real estate investment opportunities as of late, but there may be other ways to perform in this space that you are not aware of. Today on our show, we have a good friend of ours who we consider the king of Airbnb arbitrage, Mr. Ivan Tejeda. All right, Ivan. Well, thanks for coming out all the way from North Carolina, man. Yes, sir. It's Charlotte, North Carolina. Appreciate you making the trip. Absolutely, man. My pleasure. My pleasure. Nice excuse to come to Vegas, too. For sure. Yeah, that's true. A lot of, a lot of people that I know and love are here, so it was uh, nice to make a quick stop here. Nice. Yeah, it's good to have you know a friendly face from the Wealthy World coaching program here with us today to talk on the expertise of Airbnb arbitrage. Yep, I'm here for you guys, man. I got to be honest, being very selfish during this podcast here because yep. we have just started to really understand and to take some action into the arbitrage space. We've been in the Airbnb space for a while, but from an owner's perspective, we bought a house, renovated it, put it up, put it up for Airbnb, which has done great. Right. Obviously, Las Vegas has been a whole whirlwind with permitting, and that's a whole other story. Right. But now we've just started. We have our first arbitrage property, and it actually went pretty smooth. Yeah. We were able to find the right property, we think. We were able to furnish it and get it ready for a digestible expense. And this is our first full month. I think we've had three, three, three or four-day bookings for the first month. Nice. Not bad. Yeah. But – Point point of my story is we're addicted. <laughs> we so are. I want to fully like squeeze yeah. you for every ounce it, of That's information on how to go from one to twenty five of these. Yeah. By the end of the year. Yeah. Yeah. Let's by the go. end of the year. Let's and go. let's just start out. You know, there's probably a lot of people that are going to be watching that when we say arbitrage, they have no idea what we're talking yeah, about. It's a so fancy let me word. Ask you, what is Airbnb arbitrage? So in essence, in the in the most simplest form, it's really just renting a property versus buying it, like you guys are used to. Mm -hmm. Renting a property, which is you know on a twelve month basis, fifteen month basis, however you have the contract, and furnishing it, making it ready for Airbnb, and getting permission from the landlord to legally do it and publish it, you know, on Airbnb for a profit. So in essence, you're grabbing an, a property that is you know, empty and you're enhancing it, making mm -hmm. it better. Mm -hmm. Right. And then you're selling it for a premium. So I like to think of it of kind of like you're buying a block of time, 12 yeah. months. Right. And you're selling smaller blocks of time sure. at a premium because love you have that. an enhanced version of that same property. I love that outlook on it. Um, you know, what's the biggest benefit of owning or owning an Airbnb versus arbitraging an Airbnb property? So the benefits come from when owning, you guys know, like tax benefits, you know, if you have right. other, other income that you want to start writing off things, mm -hmm. you know, then the buying option is, is there. However, you can't scale as fast, right? Because with arbitrage, you literally need just mainly furniture money mm -hmm. and then maybe some deposit money and such. Right. You don't have to deal with down payments or closing costs and you don't have to deal with a 30 day plus process of closing on a home, right. all of these different nuances that you guys are very well aware of, mm -hmm. you don't have to deal with. So you can scale much faster and, and cash flow really quickly. So that's one of the biggest benefits of doing arbitrage versus buying. And I think a lot of people are attracted to that because when they want to get into rental investing and maybe even specifically short-term rental investing, a lot of people that want to start don't necessarily have the capital to start. Right. So they don't have forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars to put down on a house. More than that to renovate it or get it ready and furnish it, and then that's just more expense up front just for one property. One hundred percent. That that maybe is an average property. That average property for a deposit or first month's rent two, three thousand yeah. dollars. Much more digestible 100%. for somebody to get in. So. That's really not the reason we liked it. We liked it because it's quicker and faster to scale because right. we have to find a house every time, renovate a house every time. Yeah. So we feel like we could go to two dozen, three dozen units in a very short amount of time versus if we had to buy them. 100%. And I like to think of it really like the arbitrage side of things. You guys are doing it the other way around where you're kind of taking a step back because buying yeah. is the ultimate goal. Right. Obviously, mm -hmm. That's how you build real wealth. Right. <laughs> Arbitrage is mostly to build cash flow, which is obviously great, right? You guys so we're doing it backwards. <laughs> yeah, so you guys are doing it because in ProHost, what we teach is like there's three phases of ProHost um, phases. Phase one is is actually property management, right? Where you manage properties for people like us that okay. have their properties. You don't have to do anything. You're investors, whether you're buying 
for the most part is when you're buying properties, you just don't you want to cash flow more, but don't want to do the day to day operations. Mm -hmm. Phase two is arbitrage, where now you have a little bit more skin in the game, you're going to make more of more money, right? Because as a property manager or co host, you're making 10 to 30% at most for the revenues of sure. what that property produces. But with arbitrage, you could, you know, furnish it, do everything that we're doing, and make a lot more than that, and then eventually move into buying properties, that would be like phase three. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you guys, are, and a lot of people are doing that, where they're taking a step back and actually getting into arbitrage, even though they already own property, yeah. um, just to increase that cash flow and just because of the fact that you can grow much faster. Yeah. Um, it's it's a lucrative approach. However, when I don't know in what kind of communities or properties you guys are picking up. Is it single family? Is single it family homes. Single family homes? Yeah, in okay. non-HOA areas. Oh, okay, perfect. So with, with me, for example, and a lot of the students in ProHost, they're going the approach that um, we're going into apartment communities, getting okay. apartment units. Okay. The cool thing about that is that once you get into an apartment community and you get approved for that for the first one, you can literally grow within, right? And then it's literally like you have a little hotel inside of True. apartment communities. So mm -hmm. in our case, we have, for example, one building across from the other and two built in these two buildings that are independent from one another. Mm -hmm. We have like 16 units and then our cleaners just go in there and they're like Easy. going from one to another, cleaning them all yeah. up, right? So it, it's nice to go that route. But the single family route obviously is, is lucrative as well because you can you know, sleep more people, mm -hmm. more people you sleep, more money you make. Right. So do the apartment units, you know, here in Vegas, we have a lot of HOAs and the HOAs are very strict in terms of short-term rentals and the usage of the actual apartments. Mm -hmm. I know other markets, it's a lot more lenient. Do you ever have any problems with the management saying, no, you, you can't do short-term rentals here or do they not know about it? Oh no, for sure. There's Obviously, they're becoming a lot more privy to yeah. the whole arbitrage deal, you know, from the sense of um, like the apartment communities that, that are operated by corporations. They're very much aware of that. So mm -hmm. um, we kind of teach it to where you are going into it as a corporate housing company, but you do things a little bit differently from a regular traditional corporate housing model, mm -hmm. where in regular traditional corporate housing models, they usually go out and get the clients first, and then they look for a property to find that fits that client, right? So whether it's, you know, an executive that's staying for a period of time to stay in a certain city that they're not, they don't live in, yeah. um, and they're, they're renting it out for maybe six months or whatever, they go out and get those properties based upon that client. But we're doing it differently. We're getting the properties first and then getting the clients. And how we go about it in, in the sense of like when we pitch it to the landlords or the apartment communities and all of that, we just don't say trigger words. Like you start saying hosting or Airbnb or you start saying different synonymous you yeah. know words to Airbnb and it's going to give a red flag. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that to say that we're going to lie to them. We're just going to omit the little because th the reality is that the only reason they don't want it people to do Airbnb is because of the negative stigma. Right. They've been told Airbnb not to. Right. Yeah. Right. right. And then a lot of them that we're dealing with and talking to, they're just button pushers. They're just, you know, hearing from the sure. top down and they're just executing on what they're told. Yeah. So they don't really know the dynamic. So it's more so like through the pitching process and, and there's a whole process for this. Um, it's more so making them, you know, comfortable with understanding that we're not just, just anybody trying to put, you know, random people into these properties that we're going to be vetting them and all these different things to make them feel comfortable and do business together. So without giving away too much, because I know you got to get into the course to get all the info. <laughs> but if you were going to uh, approach, give us like a Spark Notes version of a property manager, uh, apartment unit manager to talk about leasing their unit as a corporation. When you approach the fact or the, the statement of, well, how do we find our clients? How do we find the people to fill the unit? Instead of saying things like, we're going to put the unit up on Airbnb and book it out, yeah. Yeah. what are some things you say? What are some phrases or words you say that mean the same thing, right. may mean the same thing, but get the point across without saying it? So the main thing in our case is what, and what I teach is that we, we make it a point to, that they know that we mainly house like working travelers, travel nurses, mm -hmm. professionals, right? That, that already is going to give them a little bit more of an ease mm -hmm. to the situation. And then we, we also let them know that we do, you know, screenings, background checks, okay. um, all of these different things that just in the end, 
makes it to where they don't feel like you're doing Airbnb per se. But then we also are very transparent in saying they're going to be staying for months at a time, weeks at a time, days at a time. Sure. We kind of sneak it in there, throw mm-hmm. it in there. Mm-hmm. Because at the end of the day, how we approach it is this. I'm going to give you guys like the, the cliff notes pretty much. So mm-hmm. number one is contacting the landlords, right? You, you call them, but you don't want to pitch it. So in essence, it's all you're really asking is if they accept corporate leases. Okay. Right? So they have step corporate. One. Step one. Boom. If you're contacting a um, community, then you ask them also if they're capped because a lot of these communities are going to be capped in how many corporate leases they can have out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So usually they have like a percentage, right? right. So those two questions, is the, if the answer is, you know, if they accept it, yes. And if they're not capped, no, boom, then, okay, great. I would love to make an appointment to go and tour the property. And that's where the magic happens. So you go into the tour and then we do like the, our story, tell mm-hmm. our story, which mm-hmm. in the story is kind of like the pitch, which is what I told you about how we're different from corporate housing. And then we say how we house people for months, days, weeks at a time. Mm-hmm. Um, we use different avenues to um, get our, our listings. We don't even say listings to get our properties um, occupied and so forth and so on. And then from there, we request request the lease agreement okay. via email, right? Because in the lease agreement is where the clauses are going to be that, hey, you can't Airbnb is going to be blatant. Right. Mm-hmm. You can't no do VRBO. Sub-leasing. No right. subleasing. Yeah. All of these different clauses that are going to technically prohibit us from doing our business model, right? right. right. So the idea there is that we request it via email and then – you respond to the same person that you spoke with throughout the tour that you told your story. You already literally picked out all of the different things that are going to, you know, are going to be in the lease agreement. You kind of already mentioned them to them. Mm-hmm. Right. And then it's just a matter of responding to that lease agreement. Hey, I, I look, I really love the property. If you did love it and you want to move forward, I love the property. Thank you so much for showing me the, the property. It's great. I think it does fit our portfolio. I think we would be a great team as far as, because also one thing is, you gotta kind of have to approach it as a partnership versus a landlord tenant relationship. Okay. Right. Right. So you have to say, Hey, like I'm scratching your back, you're scratching mine. Cause they're going to be able to lease these properties. Right. Mm-hmm. So that was a little, just a little gem in there also. Yeah. But then you respond and say, Hey, I looked at the, um, we looked at the, at the contract or at the lease agreement. And it turns out that, you know, clause blase blase says that, you know, we are not able to do this and this. And of course, as I mentioned through our walk, like, we actually do it this way. I just wanted to make sure that we were still on the same page okay, and that, you know, we can still move forward. If so, please let me know. I'll get this signed over to you as soon as possible. Now, does that mean omit those things from the yes. adjust agreement? Lease agreement. Wave, okay. yeah. wave those clause. Got yeah. it. The moment that they respond with saying, oh, yeah, I remember you saying that everything's good. Um, we shouldn't have any problems. That's a waiver. You don't people think that you need some sort of addendum. Right. Just in writing. Just yeah. Just an, an email. email. An email is, is right. good enough. Right. Right? Oh, wow. Okay. That could that could be hold in the court of law. Interesting. Right? Yeah, so and that's a receipt too. Like if man, if management changes, which has happened to me, yeah, management has changed, and you know we had a, a different management company dealing with us when we first got in there, and then we kind of had to repitch. It's like, hey, no, listen, I have the emails of we have permission to do this gotcha. here, type of thing. So that's really like the approach to getting into apartment communities with like you guys that are going to single family homes, and you're probably dealing with the owners themselves or realtors is even easier. Really? Much easier. Okay. Just because you don't have to deal with the corporate animal yeah. of mm-hmm. management companies. It's one to two people. Yeah, exactly. So right. it's either the actual owner or it's a personal property manager that's in direct contact with the owner. Exactly. So we're actually doing something pretty new. We're, we're actually, I haven't really announced it. It's actually, you guys are going to get the Here we exclusive. go. Oh, let's go. Let's we're, not. We're, la- we're launching pro host management. So we're going to do management for people like you guys and other people that are investors that they don't want to do the day-to-day operations. But what we're going to do is we're actually going to go on Zillow, right? And we're going to contact uh, owners of properties that are single family, you know, larger properties that we don't deal with corporate uh, stuff. And we're going to pitch them the idea to actually invest in their property to furnish it so that they can cash flow a lot more. Mm -hmm. And if they say no, we're going to obviously do it really well so that they do take up, up on that offer of, you know, putting it up on Airbnb. Obviously we'll target places that don't have HOA so they Mm -hmm. don't have to deal with, basically what you guys are doing. Now, if they say no, the idea would be is like, okay, what about if we rent it from you? Because yeah. we already did our pitch. They already know what we're going to do. Yeah. We're giving you the opportunity to do yourself so you can cash flow all of this or all these <laughs> things. But okay, what if we just take it from you and then we'll pay you your rent or we'll add another hundred bucks a month? Love it. You know, and you still have access to the property. You still have it in for sale conditions if you ever want to sell it. You, you know, all these beautiful, you know, things that we obviously tell them at the same time, like their pain points yeah. are very much there. Um, and then 
that's going to be like the cell in essence. So we'll, we'll lead with management. And then if not, we'll get, and then the cool thing is that for those that are in pro host management, I mean, I'm sorry, in pro host, the education platform, they'll have access to all of these deals. Love it. And subleasing. That's sweet. Yeah. So super stoked about that. Do you, you talked about signing like a year or 15 month lease. What is your standard time frame that you do go for? Because in my mind, an owner or a property manager, either way, a landlord or a property manager, and we know because we own rentals, last thing we want to do is just deal with a one-year tenant and then have to pay to turn it over and repaint right. it and do all the carpet and everything that was destroyed during that tenancy, just put the money out and then get someone else in. Like for me, I think it's super advantageous to have someone there for three years or five years. Yeah. What What do you go for in terms of lease terms? As much as I can. Yeah. For that very reason. So you'd yeah. love a two, three, four year oh, lease. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay. yeah. But the thing is that since most of my properties are in apartment communities, their yeah. leases are, are are capped at like fifteen. That's okay. the max. Twelve, yeah. fifteen is the most as that I've seen. We just finished renewing one of our properties for fifteen months. That's the cap. Like I said, hey, can we do it for two, three years? I would love to lock in the rate, sure. right? Because that's sure. one of the reasons too. Mm-hmm. But um, no, they, they, they're not able to do it. However, if you go through like you, what you're saying, it's if you're going to single family homes, you're dealing with landlords directly. Obviously, the doors open up for that kind right. of. OK, pro- yeah. makes sense. Yeah, because that was one of our biggest sales was, hey, instead of you having to pay to turn this over with a one year tenant, one, we're going to treat your home like a five star hotel, because right. we all know that on Airbnb, you need five stars to truly make all the money. Right. right. You right. need those bookings. So. We're going to keep it in the best tip top shape yeah. that we could possibly see. Because your business your, depends on it. Because yeah. our business depends on it. So that's, you know, we make it feel like a partnership. Like, look, we're going to keep your home in the best condition possible because we know our business relies on that. So you're going to get the, we're going to over upgrade your home. Like we're going right. to put stuff like blinds in your house. We're going to do certain things to it where when we leave, you actually get to keep those items as well because they were built for your home. Right. No, I love that. Yeah. I mean, on the, the fact that you guys are already landlords, you know your pain points more yeah. than anybody yeah. else. You yeah. could use that towards your advantage, right? We so. should have him grade us. Yeah. We should do this. <laughs> Ivan's going to grade us. We're going to tell you the four or five things we put into our agreement and okay. see if you do those, you resonate with those, you suggest them, whatever it is. Cool. So the first thing we did was longer lease. So you mm-hmm. don't have to turn it over. Yeah. Right. That's a big plus. It costs money to turn it over. Yeah. That works in both favors. Yeah. Second thing we did was we had to ensure that we have an out. So in case, and since we're doing it in Las Vegas, mm-hmm. in case regulation changes, some regulation yeah. or some governing body tells us what you're doing, you can no longer do, we need to give you notice. We need to pay maybe a month's rent for a 30-day notice, and we're allowed to break our lease without any further penalties. So we wrote that in there. They agreed to that. In order to get that, we paid them like, a couple hundred bucks over what 10% they were asking. more. So they're yeah. asking 3000 a month. So it's yeah. 3300. And we gave them 3300. Great. So yeah. you gain an extra 10% of revenue automatically with our lease. Especially for, when that landlord is having trouble renting the property. Right. Maybe they're trying to get that price. They have it active yeah. and looking for a tenant for a while. All of a sudden comes along this corporate tenant, pay me 10% more. Right. right That's right. another pain and, point. And too. the thing is that you guys have access to see what's been sitting in the market yeah. for a while. Yeah. Right? yeah. It's beautiful. The last thing we did was we increased going along the lines of telling them we're going to run this like a very nice hotel, a five-star hotel where we need it to be that way for all of our guests and you want us to treat your property that way. Right. So we'll also increase our repair threshold. Mm. So in, usually it's like a hundred bucks, 150 bucks for a year long standard tenant. We went way up. So increasing that where in the landlord's mind, wow, almost anything that goes on now besides major mechanicals, right, you guys are going to take care of. Right. Amazing. That was yeah, another thing we did. Yeah. Yeah. Did no, we leave dude. anything out? How do we do? No, I think that's, bro, A plus, man. I think that that's, you know, underst- like I said, understanding the pain points because yeah. you know what they really want and need. You know, the fact that you also approach people who are hurting already and it's like, yeah. this thing has been sitting. Yeah. You literally like the golden child right. that just came along. It saved their lives type of thing. And we didn't even come in and go, dude, your, your property has been on the market for 90 days. We'll pay you less, but you guess right. we're could've. paying you. We could have, yeah. we're paying you more, right. even though your property's property has been right. sitting yeah. because we know the benefits of, of having that as one of our own. 
um, to arbitrage with and the cash flow side of it. So it's been great. I think the only thing that we really want to start being able to negotiate and tell me if you do this on any of your deals is obviously we talked about ownership long term. Yeah. yeah. Do you ever do options, purchase options? No, since I deal mostly with property management, apartment, com- units. apartment units that yeah. they're only rented. And then the one property that I do own, I already own. Yeah. Um, but no, absolutely. I would, I would, you know, consider that though, it, moving into properties that are, that can potentially be I have lease options. Cause yeah. I love that model of like, okay, arbitrage is like easy setup, quick cash flow. You can get into it fast for a low, uh, low entry fee. Yeah. And, really test whether you like that property or not. Right. If it doesn't cash flow what you really want it to after two years, boom, you bail out. You're out. Yeah. But if it does and you make twenty, thirty thousand dollars a year, you just built up a down payment to go <laughs> ahead and buy that house that's working that's for you. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. So it's almost a little test method of yep. arbitrage first. If you love it, go in and buy it. Even if you have to overpay a little bit over mm-hmm. market value and do something to convince that landlord to sell you that house at the end of the day you know right. it's a good cash flowing asset for years to come. Right. And or you can find a a, a similar house nearby in the same neighborhood that'll probably do the exact yeah. same and and do that as well if if they're unwilling to sell. Mm-hmm. But that's exactly the model that we're using for Dominican Republic. We're going to be doing hopefully soon here. I'm going next week and hopefully we we um we lock in a, a lease for an arbitrage deal. The the idea is exactly that. We're going to rent it first. If it works out, we're going to start buying a crap load of properties. Is it a house? It's an apartment. It's an apartment. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's an apartment in the marina where next to it, it has like resorts. So people will be able to buy day passes to the resorts, but have the exclusivity of having their own property overlooking the pool. Super nice, bro. And it's like $1,200 a month. Nice. So in your, with your units, besides the house, mm-hmm. which it probably it is a different classification, diff- you can yeah. sleep a lot more people, different thing yeah. versus the apartment units. What is your desired cash flow per unit? Per month for the for the for the smaller units for smaller units i'm guessing these are one to two bedrooms no they're actually well yeah we have the majority of them are studios and one bedrooms okay right and then the cash flow profit and we're looking at on average 13 to 1500 dollars per door net net profit yeah. net so yeah. your take home per unit yeah that's a lot it is yeah. that's great. that's more than i thought yeah and then for the uh two bedroom we're at about two thousand Okay. And then our the townhouse that we have, it's a three bedroom. Yeah. Um, we're at about 2,500, 2,800. Just that's gets right. a little more as it yeah. goes up. And that's yeah. why, honestly, I love this business model more than anything else out there right now because it's low entry. You could get in quick, you could scale it quick, and it's going to cash flow three to five times more, or maybe more, but yeah. at least a three to five X of what a traditional rental would cash flow yeah, in that same apartment complex. Yep. Yeah. There's no way a traditional unit in that apartment complex is cash flowing fifteen hundred or two thousand a month. There's no, no they're way. doing two, three hundred bucks. Right, right exactly. Month. Yeah. It's crazy. One thing that you mentioned is you do go in and do some renovations to the properties. The one we found, we actually found a property that was pretty much flipped. It was a pretty much turnkey modern flip yep. property. Okay. Um, so we just had to go and put furniture and accessorize it. Cost us like twenty twenty five thousand to do everything with it. It's a pretty decent sized house, lots of bedrooms. Yeah, how much are you putting into like renovations on these units? So since we arbitrage, we don't put anything at all. Oh, so you're not renovating them? No, just furniture, oh, just okay. furnishing. Okay, yeah. And then the one property that we own, we bought it new construction, so so it was ready. To, it was ready to go. Okay, I mean, cool. if it's a rental apartment unit, you're really not allowed to right. change things. And at, at the end of the day, you don't want to invest too much money into yeah, it right. anyways. So you're going to return it. Yeah. But mm-hmm. I did do some cosmetic like things to the property that we own since we own it and mm-hmm. everything that I invest into it is going to stay there. We put like an accent wall. That's really nice. Oh, okay. Yeah. Maybe you could put a clip somewhere here where you can see that house, yeah. but it's really nice. I put some accent walls in the, the living room and the bathroom has an accent wall that matches with the kitchen and all these things. But other than that, man, it's turnkey. I, I want as least amount of, you know, activity required for me to just get the property up and running. You know, so I literally just got another property. Um, it's going to be live tomorrow, as a matter of fact. And it just ordered a bunch of the stuff t- from Wayfair, Amazon, yeah. Yeah. all that stuff is getting to the, like the mail room. And then it's just hiring some people to unbox everything and put it in place. Yeah. We're done in a day and a half. And it's up and running that same day. I have it listed so from nice. before I even published it. Because wow. I already have units Pictures. that look exactly yeah. the same like yeah. that one. And then they already have bookings for three months for, cause now we're moving into our higher season. So we get midterm bookings versus short term for like 
most of the summer or a month right. of the summer. Yeah, we got like a bunch that. of interns coming yeah. in and all of that. So I was going to ask, like, who is your target market? Because we're here in Vegas, so I think we're jaded by the Vegas market. Where like right. we're catering to parties and events. Are you catering more towards like young professionals and yeah. professional, you know, careers? For sure. So my my target demographic is working travelers, travel nurses. Um, for the most part, and then we literally designed the, the listing to cater to them. So we have little workstation for them to work from, make gotcha. them feel like at home, you know, have have a little coffee station, yeah. you know, things that are, but these type of people are literally just sleeping there for the right. most part. They're just going yeah. in, then going out, and it's like the best dynamic for me. It's like the best. So um, they barely use the place. They yeah. barely and use and it. are they near like convention centers or business centers or districts that really they're close to where they need to be when they get there. Yeah. So in essence, what I did, my strategy in the very beginning, before I had, you know, any knowledge of how to really run and operate a Airbnb business, I just posted up next to hotels. Mm -hmm. They already invested millions of dollars in market research to know that they can build a multi-million dollar, yeah, multi-million dollar structure. Yeah. They are, they already know I'm just going to take their business yeah. and pro provide a product that's superior to what they're offering. Because mm -hmm. our real competitors are hotels. Yeah. For, for my niche, right? Like the one bedroom studios, you guys don't have any competition when you have larger homes because yeah. they can't offer that. Right? Right. Five, six bedrooms. Is different. Right. right. Your, your competitor is other Airbnb hosts, but they're not really competitors because once their calendar is blocked because they have a booking, yours is available. Yeah. Right. right. The hotel is my biggest competitor because they have 150, 200 doors yeah. that they can just, you know, fill people in. But my, my property has a kitchen. My property has more of a, you know, homey feel. Yeah, and a all patio these, to sit on. Right. Or, all of these different things that they can't offer. So that was my approach in the beginning. And it still is. If you want to do, you know, if you don't want to do a whole lot of market research and know what crunching numbers is like and all these different things, just go next to a hotel room. Boom. That's a question. I that, like that. That's great advice, honestly. <laughs> you write that down. Yeah. Because watch this. If you if you see a McDonald's, usually you see a, a Burger King right yeah. next to it, and then you see Wendy's. Right. One yeah. of them was there first. For sure. They the did other the ones just work. came. Yeah, yeah. The other ones just came. Same thing with CVS and Walgreens. It's nothing new. Yeah. yeah. Right? Is we're just doing it as we're a smaller fish in the pond, but we're still doing it. So when you when you most of your units are centered around Charlotte. Yeah. Exactly. They're, they're, they're all in Charlotte. They're all in Charlotte. Okay. Yeah. Did you live in Charlotte and you decided, I'm going to do this, let me start in my backyard? Or was it, I want to do Charlotte for other reasons? No, so I actually moved from Miami and then I rented my first unit um, to be arbitraged. So th I'll give you the, like, the quick story. Sure. So we were going to move to Charlotte you know, for family, like family decisions. My wife and I were starting, a, we're going to start a family at that point. No, no kids yet and all of that, but we didn't really want to raise them in Miami. Okay. So somehow we ended up with sticking with, you know, Charlotte and we ended up moving. But before we moved, I was already getting a, a job offer to work at Allstate, which my background is in insurance sales. Okay. So um, I got the job and then we secured that one property that we did own that we built, but it still was um, like two months before it was finished being built. So we needed a place to stay in the meantime. So me thinking that this is something that I've wanted to do for a while, the arbitrage side of things, mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually lock in this lease sight unseen so that we can live in for the time being until that prop, our property is actually done. And then that eventually become our first Airbnb. Gotcha. So we used our, a lot of our own furniture to say that we only spent like $2,000 for that first unit because a lot of our own stuff was in there. So, you know, $2,000, including security deposit, all of the, those That's things. That's amazing. All in two grand, right? So by the time that the townhouse was finished being built, we moved out of it. It was staged and ready. We already had it listed for like listed for like a day or two, and it already had bookings. I'm That's like, great. yo, I made up. I might have done something. This here. works. Yeah. This <laughs> works, bro. Because of course I was super like scared, right? Your first one. First one. I didn't know what to expect, you know. But um, sure enough, it took off, and then from there, um, we actually got the townhouse um, with furniture and all that stuff. We got like. Uh, rooms to go. Do they have rooms to go here in, in Vegas? I've heard of that brand though, but no, yeah, like I, I don't know if we store. have a location here. So yeah, you, like for big box furniture store. Yeah. So we got a credit card from there and got the major furniture from, yeah. from there. And it, to this day, we're still paying that, that furniture because they have like crazy, in, like five, six years, 0% interest. Payment plans. <laughs> right. So we spent like two, 20 grand on that house um, to furnish it. And Literally, that house has been paying itself for the last five years. Yep. And then everything we did, I didn't pay myself for 12 months uh, plus 
everything that we generated, we re yeah. reinvested into the business. And that's how we grew to 12 listings in our first year, basically. So the reason I asked that question is because people like us, maybe other people out there too, are thinking they have to research and find a great market to do this in. You already had plans to move to Charlotte. Yeah. This just kind of came out of the way you were moving there right. and the needs you had at the time. Right. And ever since you proved it, you decided to double down and get a whole bunch of units there. And right. obviously you have strategies like let's go near hospitals and there's reason and rationale behind it. It all makes sense. But for someone like us looking to seek out arbitrage properties in a new market, because we don't necessarily want to do it here. It's a little difficult here. Yeah. How do we do that research? How do we decide where to go? And now that you've grown, are you doing research in other places yeah. to expand and do a new market? So the best way to think about it is how most people don't think about it in the sense of you have to first think about your ideal guest. Okay. Like, who is that? Like, describe them. Like, if mm -hmm. you want to, you want to, you know, house, you know, families that are traveling that have younger kids, maybe. Do you want to do events? You know, do you want to have a themed home? So it's really about thinking about the individual or that guest and what their life looks like to then find the product that fits that and the market that fits that. Okay. Right. So for me, given, given that I live in, in Charlotte, it turned out perfectly because there's a lot of big jobs there. There's, there's a lot of hospitals. There's all of these things that, you know, travel nurses and, and working travelers are by default gravitated towards that location. Sure. So it's really thinking about the individual first and then, you know, presenting a product that fits them. Okay. And then once you, it's time to list it, it's all a matter of, you know, creating the right verbiage or putting the mm -hmm. right verbiage in the listing description so that you, you know, attract that type of guest. And that's how you mainly do it. But any market is a good market. Like literally, as long as, you know, regulations and rules allow that's you to- That's the caveat, right? right? Yeah. As long as those things are, are straight, yeah. then you, you're good. And so what's it like in Charlotte as far as regulation goes? It is pretty lax, man. Like we're, I'm doubling down. We're the only down. ones dealing with tough regulations. So I've, I've heard of other <laughs> places, you know, that don't quite have regulation. They might have some in place, but for example, there are some counties in Florida where South Florida specifically, you might have encountered this, but you basically can buy a property, list it, do everything, and you just go register it. Yeah. So it's basically you just walk in, let them know this is yeah. what I'm doing, and there's no yes or no. Mm -hmm. You just let them know, and you're good. You pay a certain tax or something right. for it. Do you let your county know? Do you do any of that? No. no. Okay. No, in Charlotte, no. Maybe maybe I do have to, but I don't think so. Because the thing is that also within Airbnb, they also have these things where every quarter or so, mm -hmm. you get to um, you know, go on a Zoom call with the deputy or whatever, and then you know they talk about the regulations mm -hmm. and all of these things for your area if any, yeah if anything has changed and oh, all okay. that. so i like to tune every every area should um have it just oh, look into it to where yeah. you're at yeah so that you keep your ears on the on the ground sure. on that. but um that's interesting to know too but for the most part man i think that the 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 biggest takeaway i think for you guys to be able to grow as far as far as like where you're gonna go and all of that is really like think about who your ideal guest is mm -hmm. that makes a lot of sense because we've been applying the rationale we've had to the units we own mm -hmm. here in vegas to other markets so bigger groups bachelor bachelorette parties birthday yeah. parties people getaways but that's in a group of four five six or more Right. And so we're thinking, well, okay, Scottsdale, that's an area where lots of people go to vacation in groups. Right. It's affordable. It's easy to get to from a lot of other states. So that's attracting that same type of client. But if we wanted to go and attract the one to two travelers at a time, right. you know, the, the couple, the, the yeah. traveling couple, the van life couple, or the something like that, we need a totally different unit. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, 100%. The thing or is the also. Professional. Yeah, 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 one of the cons of having larger properties is the fact that you open yourself up for things that normally you wouldn't have to experience when you have smaller properties, right? So it's a parties and, mm -hmm. you know, all of these crazy yeah. things, right? So unless you are in an area where, you know, it, it's allowed, it's it's like, hey, you can, you can rent this property as an event property, yeah. then, you know, you might deal with certain things. But also the lead time for larger properties is longer. Right. Whereas I can list a property right now that is a be one bedroom or a studio and it could get booked today. Right. Yeah. yeah it's it hard for us, that to happen right. with a larger property. Like even has to look at it and say, I want it versus yeah. I mean, all think about these it. individuals, the, the last masses. Time, yeah. The last time that you guys went on a vacation with family, like everybody had to input. It's oh, like, yeah. oh my yeah. God. That, yeah. I like that one, but I like right. this one better. Just that alone extends the, the True. Lead time. True. And it's just a mission and a half to, to, to do like family trips. So if you have a, big property, that's who you're going to house because nobody's going to rent that for just two people. You right. know what I mean? Yeah. So that's also one of the 
the reasons why I love smaller properties because they're just quick. Sure, you don't make as much money per se, but at the same time, for me, it's like a little bit less of a headache. You know, I, I, I it's more predictable. You know what I'm saying? So, but another thing I want to say also mm-hmm. is like, as far as regulations go, the ones that have the stringiest regulations are the ones that have a touristic yeah, presence. I know the hotels the, fight against it. That's right. rates. The hotels are yeah. just after, yeah. after it. Like they're investing whatever they need to invest to make sure that Airbnb doesn't take more of yeah. their pie. Yeah. We have a, like ours is probably a half a mile to a mile off of the strip. Mm. And we have, we could sleep 10 to 12 people. Wow. That's taking every night that we're booked five hotel rooms to six hotel rooms yeah. away Easy. from a hotel. Right. That's a lot. And we're one unit taking six, six yeah. hotel rooms away from the strip. So yeah, they definitely don't like it there. I think yeah. there's 12,000 other units in town. So I can imagine that they would want to fight against it for sure. And how do you guys deal with, cause you, you're doing short term or you're doing 30 short days short term. Short yeah. Term. So isn't it like not allowed here? Here's the radar. This is where we are. <laughs> <laughs> I love yeah. it. We fly. We're right doing the it. pin, so we have them pinned differently and doing okay. different things. So like, okay. there's you know, we're 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 finding yeah, the loopholes. There's a few cheat codes. Okay, cool, yeah. cool. But we don't want to do it anymore here because yeah. of that. Like because we don't like doing things over your shoulder. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you know, you're. You can't run a business jumping through hoops all the time, right? right. It's got to be a set it and forget it type mentality yeah. with this type of business. That's what that's what we want. You know, we look at it as potentially passive income. Not right. actively thinking about all the problems we have to face every day with a unit to try to make a couple grand a month. It's right. just not worth it. No, it's not. For sure. That's why I was curious to see if you guys, yeah. you know, did that. However, you can list it as a midterm. Midterm. Yeah. Yeah. And they're and, just not as valuable. Right. Now, the thing is also, like, you won't make as much as, as if it's short term, like per night, but it has its benefits, right? So mm-hmm. for me and what I teach the students in ProHost is, Uh, and I apply this myself, is I optimize my pricing for midterm rentals and then I fill the gaps with short-term rentals. Okay. Mm. Because I like that predictability and I like to be able to weather storms if things spike or whatever they dip. Um, And that's been a huge differentiator for me and other Airbnb gurus, right? Like in the sense that um, I I literally have a a strategy that I wake up in the morning, five, 10 minutes, five to 15 minutes on price strategizing, putting like my multi-calendar and my screen. Mm-hmm. And then I, I literally, because I have so many units, it's easy for me to get data from the, from the, that neighborhood yeah. because they're speaking to me mm-hmm. and I'm able to tweak certain things and add rule sets and all these things that a lot of people don't even know exist within Airbnb. It's not a third party sure, okay. you know, service or anything like that. So, I mean, price strategy, I think is what makes me different from pretty much every other person. I think that's doing, um, Airbnb because most people have it on price labs or you know automated AI sure. uh, pricing tools which, which are good it. which are good I, I'm, I'm starting to create like a hybrid version of it okay um, so I can kind of tweak things because the things with like these pricing tools is that they can't use the rule sets that Airbnb provides and by rule sets is what I mean is like rules right so if I have a weekend and I want to give a, a client or a guest a discount for booking the entire weekend yeah. versus just one night in the weekend. Yeah. I can set a rule set to do that. Or I can actually, within that same rule set, I can make it to where if they book that weekend plus two days of my week, I'll give them more of a discount. Mm-hmm, sure. So it attracts these individuals that I want, right? Yeah. By the same token, my strategy is to create rule sets that attracts midterm rentals. And then I just basically flash sale any any nights that are not booked from here to two weeks. Get something. Weeks out. Yeah. 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 That's interesting. You have a lot of the same style units too, right. telling right. you more and more and more from your one place. Exactly. That's another question I had. If we wanted to go somewhere and do it, would you suggest, let's say we wanted to go for the one to two uh, people type of say, so one bedroom, studio, that type of thing. Would we, or would you suggest going to one area and getting a few of those in the area the reason I'm asking this is because if we didn't do that, if we got those types of units, but in three states, how do you manage that? Yeah. Or managers or cleaners and all this stuff. It just makes the most sense to, if it's something is working, just milk it. Yeah. You mm-hmm. know, like it just makes life a lot easier for so many different reasons. Number one, let's just give you a scenario here. If something happens where the cleaners didn't make it in time and the property isn't cleaned or you know, something slipped through the crack and the property, which has happened to us, literally happened to us yesterday, where something happened where our cleaners didn't go in there. All we had to do is move them to a next door. Different unit. Right. Boom. Different unit. Right. Another thing is also is like, if you have them all together in one location, 
you can start to compete with yourself in that sense. You can start creating your own pricing yeah. for that location, mm-hmm. right? There's so many different benefits. Cleaning, you know, turnover. If a cleaner goes over there and they know they have to do two, three units in that same property or like the same vicinity, yeah. it's just a lot easier versus having to commute totally. and all these things. Totally. So from a cost perspective, logistics perspective, and an investment perspective, it just makes sense for you to stay there. Right. And I would start in your backyard whenever possible. Yeah. Except for ours. Except for us. Yeah. Exactly. We got we to gotta go somewhere else. Right. Are there right. any other markets you're looking at outside of Charlotte? Just Dominican Republic right now my, and Miami, actually. Even okay. though it's, uh, I just have so many students. My home base is Miami and yeah. I have like the infrastructure. I have people that I trust Boots over on the there. Ground, right. Yeah. So I, it, it just makes sense that eventually I'll go there, which is what's happening also with Dominican Republic. And uh, it's called Capcana, which is. Um, it's basically like a big community city that is for tourism only, but it's uh, it's beautiful. And uh, I have a cousin that lives over there and works over there, so he's going to be my boots on the ground. Love it inside. Yeah. So uh, you self manage. Sorry, you self manage all of your own units. Yeah. Do you think it only makes sense to self manage, or do you think it makes sense to hire property managers? Because I mean, the price difference is quite drastic at some point. Right. It really depends on, cause all of this, the, the main thing is having the knowledge and the know how to, to execute and maximize profit profitability, having the right occupancy, all of these different things. That's another thing. Like when you have multiple units in the same location, you can move people around just so that your calendar is open mm-hmm. for the bigger bookings, which you can't do if you have them in different cities. True. Because right? we were talking today about paying our property manager, like, man, we pay him a lot, you know, he, but he does a great job. Like yeah. he, he's definitely doing a really good job with our units. But mm-hmm. if we did it ourselves or had someone internally that worked for us on staff doing it, right. We could make an extra 20 to 25% a month on these, which is a drastic increase in for income. Sure. It really boils down to what you want to do as far as is is it worth your time or not? Mm Because technically speaking, you guys could have hung this. You guys could have been doing the recording for all of these different things. But you'd rather just outsource it because your time is more valuable elsewhere. And you don't want to go through the process and the learning curve of knowing how to do it right. Right. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it really depends on where you're at in life. You know, the students that we have in ProHost, they're, they're learning the grind they're learning the nuances, the different things, so that they can come to people like me and other people that don't want to deal with the day to day, but have the cash to invest into properties, so that they can be the person doing it. And they deserve, you know, their they have the skill 20, set now. Exactly, right? right? They're they're taking a, a load off of your back. So sure. sure, it's a lot, but it's really not when you think about the cash flow ability behind it. You, if especially if you're doing arbitrage where you have pretty much no money into yeah. the deal, like it's free money. Yeah if you're hiring someone to do it. Yeah. You get what I mean? I, sometimes I look in there and I look at all the messages. Yeah. That, the coordination that goes back. I want no part of no that. Part yeah. of that. No part of that. It's a lot. No part of that. No way. I get and it. it's all day and all night. Yeah. yeah. What you can do is, which is, which is what I did. So I'm not responding to guests and all that. I have a reservations coordinator um, that's been with me for three, four years now. And she handles all of the communications and all of that. I stick to what I like doing, which is price strategy, sure. mm-hmm. put out fires here and there, of course, yeah. mm-hmm. but eventually now with pro host management, like all of that's going to be taken care of. I'm just going to probably just oversee the whole thing and, and probably still do some, some price strategy. Um, but yeah, it really depends whether it's worth it to you or not. It really depends upon your time, whether you want to learn it or not. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So another good question we thought of earlier, specifically for you on this one, since you're in Charlotte, and very close to Florida, the Gulf, like that whole area being prone to weather events. Mm -hmm. What's your opinion on that? Because I think your opinion will drastically differ from an arbitrage investor versus a buy and I own type of Airbnb investor. Right. Specifically for those geographical areas that are prone to disastrous weather events. Have you dealt with hurricanes on your units or any damage to your units from weather yet? No, not yet. Since my properties are in Charlotte, we're pretty far from the coast. We're you're like inland. Four, yeah, yeah, we're inland. We're like four hours plus from oh, okay. the, you're, yeah, from you're the coast. But, but even, Miami, obviously. But even in Miami, I mean, those things are built with concrete on the outside. You yeah. know, they're, they, they can weather a storm. It, they'll be stuck inside of the property, but it's going to be good. And if we're doing it arbitrage, then I have no real, like, reservation because their insurance company is going to handle any damages as True. well. And then Airbnb has a massive insurance policy, policy or uh, program, you know, so from a liability and then all of that stuff, I'm not concerned. My job would be to make sure at my best ability to have it filled with people in it. Yeah. 
if that happens, that way it's it's inse- like it's, um, it's generating money regardless of whether there's yeah. a hurricane or not. I think it's very different though from somebody who's looking in those areas to buy a house. If you're the owner of the house, then it's your insurance and yeah. you're looking at things that need to be replaced or repaired constantly, For sure. like new roofs, or if you're buying a house to renovate it to then rent it, mm-hmm. in replacing windows with hurricane impact windows and doing some of those expensive things and sometimes pretty frequently, more frequently than you want to do right. when you own that property. So right. ownership might make more sense in a place where you don't have to quite worry about those drastic weather events. Right. But arbitrage all of a sudden in those same places makes total sense. Yeah. Yeah. No, exactly. And I think also like when you're buying a property in places like Miami, where you are more prone to get a hurricane and yeah. stuff, even though they haven't had one in years, they're, they're kind of due for one. <laughs> um, they haven't had one in years, but they usually come prepped for that kind of you know, you know, disaster, right? So they already have shutters in place. So you would have mm-hmm. to hire some people to come out and install shutters while you maybe have guests in there. But anybody who's traveling to Florida should know that that's the possibility, right? Sure, right. sure. I'm just thinking from owning perspective right. of expenses. Right. Like, okay. Yeah. I mean, a hurricane comes through and takes a roof and some windows out. Your entire year of income is pretty much right. gone. Even right. just heavy rains all the time. Like yeah. not only just leaking, but flooding, like storm yeah. surges and things yeah. that, that just do happen. It doesn't destroy the house, but you do have to fix it every time that happens. Yeah. It's just an additional expense you have yeah. to add into that. That so why, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna pick a place to own, obviously I'm attracted to that place because it's a more of a year round. Mm-hmm. It's gonna bring higher nightly rates. Yeah, but I also have pros and cons. Exactly, yeah. it's really outweighing the pros and cons. And and you know Miami does bring in some pretty you know big spenders too. So yeah. your your rents and the rentability of that property is gonna go up. So it could pretty much offset any expense you may have from any disaster that might happen every couple of years, mm-hmm. if that. So makes sense. Yeah, it really depends. So let me ask you. You have 17 now. Yeah. How many do you want? I don't know. How many how many do you, how many properties do you guys want? I don't think I have a number um, like, as far as how many arbitrage, I'm pretty I'll tell you guys this and I don't think I've ever said it out loud, but I'm pretty much done with arbitrage unless it's meets testing a new market. Yeah. Before I start buying there. Okay. Right? Cuz the idea is now like I want to build wealth, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Rental arbitrage, cash flow, you know, it helped me get out of my nine to five. I live a very, you know, nice life now because mm-hmm. of it. Like I don't take that for granted. It taught me a lot, right? I'm able to help a whole bunch of people. I love that. But now it's time to actually buy property. You got to own assets. Yeah, yeah. you got to own assets. Now we're you know, making a little bit of money on education and there and mm-hmm, these. Sure. And I want to take advantage of the tax benefits that sure. come with it, you know? So um, how many I want? Like this year I told myself I wanted to get... 30 doors. Um, I didn't really specify how, but I meant buying them. Okay. And I'm at zero right now, so I need to step up my game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it could be a multi... I'm, I'm aiming more towards sure. multifamily, so yeah. that could be one deal. Possibly maybe. to, like, buy one, an 8-plex, a 12-plex, or something yeah. bigger, maybe. Yep, and, and Airbnb them. Yeah. All of them. Love yep. it. Oh, wow, that's crazy. Yeah. That's what I want to do. And I already have, like... I want to do it in Charlotte. I already have the infrastructure, the team. I already have everything. It's like... Let's go. Like, I know the numbers. Yeah. It's just finding the right deal, which I don't know how to do yet, um, really, and, like, how to do the underwriting sure. and all that stuff. Multifamily is a little But different. I have investors. I have people that, you know, believe in what I, I do, and I have my receipts. So yeah. I'm like, listen, I could do this, yeah. you know? So it's just a matter of, you know, putting those pieces to the puzzle. Okay. Hopefully we can do it. All right. How do we... I know exactly how we... Get some arbitrage por- properties and... Charlotte. Find him a 12-plex, yeah. 16-plex. <laughs> we find the go. deal. We underwrite the deal. Yeah. He applies Airbnb strategy to it. There you That's go. That's a total married I love right it. there. Pro, uh, Pro Host Management manages the property. Yeah. Really Can good. we make it happen? We can make it happen, man. Let's do it. Reno- yeah, and if we, especially if we find something like discounted renovation wise, yeah. like there's nobody better. We can go into a deal together. We'll put money into it where we all own it. And mm-hmm. then I'll manage it. My management company obviously would, you know, reap Run the it. percentage and all of yeah. that. Dude, all day. Let's like, go. Let's go. All right. Done. You kidding me? We can make that happen by year end for sure. Let's go, man. I'm counting on you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. I was hoping there was going to be an opportunity for us. Yeah. There you go. We it found it. it. it we we always got to ask. You know, yeah. you, you never for get sure. unless you ask, right? For so sure. Like, and anybody go. else that wants to do any deals, yeah. let me know. Bring it to them. We'll probably put your course, um, a description, and some links, uh, whatever you'd like. Cool. Where can people find you if they do want to reach out or they have something to send you right now or they just want to learn more from you? 
The best is going to be Instagram, uh, okay. Ivan Tejeda dot co, um, T E J E D A for the last name uh, dot co, and that's going to be the best. I'm I'm always on Instagram. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Everything and else, but I'm everywhere else. I'm in TikTok. I'm in uh, YouTube. As you should be. Pretty much everywhere. This will yeah. go everywhere too. So cool. You'll have cool. that opportunity. Yeah. Sweet. Uh, yeah. Anything else we didn't cover? You want to ask or um, last minute no. here? No, man. I think we covered a lot. It was good. Yeah. I learned a lot. Yeah. yeah. No, I covered a lot. I think I think it's a good one. I, hopefully, everybody else um, resonates and learns from it so that they can actually execute with it. Just don't. The big. I'll leave you with this. Good. If you're getting this information and you're actually interested in it, don't be like so hesitant to actually pursue it. A lot of people suffer from analysis paralysis. They're just gaining this information. You probably saw the title of this video, Airbnb arbitrage, how to become a millionaire, all these different things. And you want to do that, but the information is step one, and but it's still like 20% of what actually is going to get you to where you want. 80% is actually executing on these things. So yeah. whether that be following me and learning for free, uh, following you guys as you're, you guys grow in your arbitrage uh portfolio and all these things or whatever, but actually doing it, getting your LLC, getting your bank account, start with the little things, get the little wins first. Sure. And then from there, start to grow. And next thing you know, you have a couple of units under your bag and you don't, you can leave your nine to five. I love, love that. It. That's a great strategy. Let's go. All right, guys. You heard it here first. Get after it. Get it. Let's get go. It. I'll see we you appreciate you, bro. Absolutely. Thanks for coming man. on. It was a lot of fun. Absolutely, yeah. man. I'll see you guys at the top. Let's, Let's go. go.